Let's invite the Lord to be with us. Lord, we're just so thankful we can be gathered together, Lord, in your name. And we thank you, Lord, for your promise to be with us. Pray that you might send your spirit now, Lord, to open our hearts and our ears and our eyes, Lord, that we might all see Christ today. We pray in your name. Amen. All right, once again, our mission statement. We are trying to know Christ and make him known by sharing his love. And vision, where we want to be as a church, loving Jesus Christ, serving our community, changing our world. If you don't know that by heart, write them down and think about those, especially the mission is the how to do part. All three of those things. Are you doing them this week? Getting to know Christ, um, making them known by sharing his love with other people. Very practical. So let's, let's as a church reach out more with our mission statement. At this time we have Rachel leading us out in some music. Good morning. Our first song is going to be 159, The Old Rugged Cross. If you don't know it, shame on you. If you do know it, sing really loud. 159. number 249 praise him praise him jesus our blessed redeemer 249 
as we sing our opening song, which is 216, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. Beautiful song with a beautiful story behind it. 216. Thank you, sister. Those are my favorite songs. I picked them out because I was supposed to lead out, but you folks were blessed because Rachel led out. It's time for our offering. We thank you so much. We thank you all for, so much for being generous to this church. It's a small congregation, but the lights are still on. The Lord is blessing. Let's, let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you so much that you've generously shared the resources of this earth with this congregation. We pray that you'll touch our hearts, that we might also feel some generosity in sharing with the congregation. In Jesus' name, amen.
Time for our children's story. Brother Alan's going to tell his story. Come on, brother. Thank you for telling the story. Okay. Look at those smiling faces. Are you happy today? Sabbath is a good day. Well, the story I want to tell you today happened a long time ago when Miss Angela was in third grade. Anybody in third grade? Oh. Well, we were lucky enough to go to, and live in Kenya. And we got over there, and of course it was really different. But one thing that was really exciting to me was all of the animals that we got to see. You like to see animals? You like to go to the zoo? Well, it was kind of like going to the zoo, except we didn't go to the zoo. We could look out our back window and we could see giraffe. There were um, Thompson gazelles that lived on the campus. Uh, one morning I saw a little dick dick. I saw a bush buck in our yard. <clears throat> but it was really fun to go to the game park because you could see lots of animals. In fact, I had to write them down because I couldn't remember all of them anymore. <clears throat> We wouldn't see all of them every week or every time we went, but we could see giraffe. There was water buck, there were buck, uh, impala, the Grant's gazelle, Thompson gazelle. We could see eland, a bush buck, wildebeest, hardebeest, the Cape buffalo, the warthogs, the zebra, lion, cheetah, hyena, jackal, rhinoceros, hippopotamus, monkeys, baboons. And then, of course, there were birds, the secretary bird, the uh, uh, the, um, excuse me, fish eagle, the ibis, the crown crane, the stork, and the vultures. Lots of fun things. But you know, there was one thing that we really didn't want to see that much. You know what that was? No, we saw lions. Snakes. Do you like to see snakes? <clears throat> well, I had read that there were cobras over there, but if you were careful when you hiked, you probably would never see them because if you made noise, they would run away. So we weren't too worried. We would carry a stick when we would go hiking, and we would take the students with us, and we'd go up on the hill behind us where the Maasai were, and we could just hang out and have a good time. Never saw a snake, so we weren't really that worried. But on Thanksgiving Day, we... Because we were not in America, we, didn't, we weren't celebrating Thanksgiving as a nation, but we did because we were Americans. And so we had a couple other families come over to see us and spend <clears throat> lunch with us. We finished lunch in the house that we lived in. Um, had a garage. We didn't have a car, but we had a garage, and I had some stuff out there. In fact, I was refinishing a piano so we could bring it into the house. And, as a, and Gene said, my brother said, we need some of the tools that you've brought down here. So go open the garage door. So I started out, and I got outside to open the door, and I saw this brown snake. What's that? And so I yelled at my brother. I said, hey, Gene, come here. What is this? And he goes, you don't know what that is? That's a cobra. I said, a cobra? He goes, yeah, check this out. He picked up a little stone, and he tossed it over there, and that thing was hooded right up that's scary and Jesus we got to get it out of here we don't want it around your house and so we were going to chase it and it ran it or it slithered around the corner and it went over the wall and then we could hear it grating as it went under the garage door like no we don't want it in the garage that's the worst place for it so Gene says oh we got to get it out of there <clears throat> so I ran back in the house and I put on a pair of goggles. You know why I did that? Because the cobra will spit at you. It spits its venom. And if it gets in your eye, it can blind you. So I put on a pair of goggles and I grabbed my little slingshot and I ran out there. I'm not a good shot, so it didn't do me any good. But every time I would pop my head out from behind the piano, it would spit at me. Ooh, don't want to do that. So finally, my brother jumped up on top of a table that was there. He took my hoe. And he got rid of it. So it was gone. Uh, probably a month or so later, we were doing some more clearing. 
and we found out what happened. This snake probably came because there was a bunch of bushes around the house. Ours was one of the newest houses there. It hadn't been all cleaned out, and I, apparently the snake got misplaced. But we had a, a, a bulldozer come out to clear the other side, <clears throat> and my brother was riding on the, on the cat with the, the operator, and I thought I'd go over and see how they were doing. And I walked over, and just as I got almost to him, he yelled at me, he goes, Alan, look, there's a snake. And I looked, it was a big cobra. It had its mouth open. And it was about as close as I am to you. And, oh, this is not a good thing. What am I going to do? And so the only thing I could think about was getting away from it. So I started backing up. <clears throat> Would you ever try to back up after they've been going through with a bulldozer? I fell right over on my back because <clears throat> I wasn't watching where I was going. I was going backwards. And then I thought, I'm on the ground and this thing's going to get me. What am I going to do? And I jumped up as quick as I could and I looked, but it hadn't moved. It was still sitting there. Turns out the bulldozer had run over it and it wasn't as big as it used to be. So I picked up a rock and we were done with that one. <clears throat> Interesting thing was we were on our way home after spending the year over there. And Miss Patsy said to me, that's amazing. We were there that whole time and never saw any snakes. <laughs> so, well, <clears throat> now that we're on the plane, I can tell you. <laughs> you know, there's something that reminds me <clears throat> that God loves to take care of us, doesn't he? Let's see if I can. In Psalms, it says, <clears throat> he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress. Verse 11 says, he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent will trample down. See, God is there to take care of us, isn't he? Aren't you thankful for that? Let's just bow our heads. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for... The way you love us, the way you take care of us, thank you again for this Sabbath and for these children. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't you love stories about Africa? Yeah, we love them. We have a couple people, families that spend time in Africa. It surprised me when I heard you say that you'd spend some time in Kenya. So we have other families. I'm not going to look at them. I'm going to look opposite of them <laughs> to say there's some families here that spend some time in Africa, and they have wonderful stories. It's time now for our prayers. I just remind you that we are streaming our services, so, you know, be cool. Don't, don't throw someone's business out there. Do we have anything that we need prayers for? Anybody want to give sister? Okay. We'll remember them. Any other brother? We've got a, a request to end the praise. Um, what about this time tomorrow? Dustin will be out in Walla Walla. We will do for her graduation from her doctor. Program. Oh my! So that's the phrase. The request is she still has that little dissertation that she's got to finish and defend, and she's hoping to have it done by August. So I ask the church to remember her for that. Yeah, so she's she's marching in advance of the work, is what you're saying, right? Yeah. She's. 
Good for her. Confident. We're blessed. Anyone else have a prayer that they want to? Are there silent prayers that you say, hey, I would love to do, but I'm not going to say it out loud in front of you folks? Okay, me too. It's our tradition here that if you're able, you can kneel for prayer. If not, just bow your heads. We're going to ask the Lord to bless us. Lord, we thank you so much for your blessings. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to show us your grace. We ask, Lord, that you would you let your spirit rain upon us. We thank you, Lord, for sustaining us in this small congregation of people. Somehow we sustain, you sustain us in this building, and we just thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that we're seeing some new faces today, and we just thank you for those folks that come out. I heard some families, Lord, that are in sickness, and so we ask that you'll bless them. We ask that you'll touch them, that you would heal them, that you might strengthen them. We ask, we thank you so much, Lord, for Dustin. She is, she's, oh man, she's approaching doctor, her doctor, Dustin, we're going to call her. And we just thank you so much that she is so confident, Lord, that she's, she's marching in advance of the actual completion of the work. So we know that you're, you're going to be working in that situation. Thank you so much for Dustin, Lord. We ask that you'll bless Bill and Verley as they travel, that they might travel in safety. We thank you, Lord, for our children that are now adults who maybe they don't do things as we thought they would, but we ask that you'll continue to lead the families that they might have reconciliation within these families, that we don't toss them aside, but that we keep the lines of communication open and that we keep praying for them. I just ask you for that, Lord. I thank you so much for Brother Jay. He preaches here so often and that we ask that you will let your spirit rain on him once more as he looks at those, <clears throat> as we look at the Beatitudes, I pray, Lord. Strengthen us and guide us. Thank you so much for willing hearts and spirits. We pray, Lord, that you'd also bless in a special way our nominating committee, that you might let the spirit soften hearts as, that's, as they hear their name read out, that they might understand that you're calling them and that we're not calling, but you are calling them. So we ask, Lord, again, that you would continue to bless and show us your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture today is Matthew 5, chapter 5, verse 9. Matthew 5, verse 9. And the word says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. There's one place I'd rather be. It would be uh, sitting listening to John Bradshaw <laughs> speak at the present time. So, yeah, we're having Kentucky, Tennessee camp meeting, if you haven't noticed that. And at kytn.net, you can join in. And I think all the talks are streamed and then archived. So if you missed it, missed it. But, again, John Bradshaw was speaking this week, last night, um, this morning, and this evening again. So tune in. For a blessing and all and the whole week you can catch it you know the nice thing with that you can stream all uh, you'd not be there and still get it all um, other than the fellowship i can think of no better way to introduce the subject of peace today than to sing sing about it so i'm going to sing a song called wonderful peace far away in the depths of my spirit today rolls a melody sweeter than song in celestial act strains it unceasingly falls for my soul like an infinite calm Peace, peace, wonderful peace Coming down from the Father above Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray In fathomless billows of love what a treasure i have in this wonderful peace buried deep 
in my innermost soul. So secure that no power can mine it away, while the years of eternity roll. Peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in the fathomless billows of love. I believe when I rise to that city of peace, where the author of peace I shall see. That one strain of the song which the ransomed will sing in that heavenly kingdom will be. Peace, peace, wonderful peace Coming down from the Father above Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray In the fathomless billows of love. Weary soul without gladness or comfort or rest, passing down the rough pathway of time. Make the Savior your friend ere the shadows grow dark. Oh, accept of this peace so sublime. Peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit, Forever I pray in fathomless billows of love. Have you ever remember being in school? Teacher walks in and says, okay, class, close your books. What does that mean? Test coming up, right? Closed book test, we used to call them. Every once in a while, you get an open book test. Closed book test. We're going to do it once more, right? We got it all down pat. We're on number seven today of the Beatitudes. We got number eight coming up, the last one, but they, they have two postscripts on it, so we got a couple more weeks still. But remember the first Beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Say it with me. Blessed are the... They, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And today, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. And blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we're gonna look at those again. Really, if you, if you look at that, we're gonna look at the gospel of peace today. Uh, for I think you have to have um, peace in order to be a peacemaker. And we've looked over the years, you know, times, and there's just some scriptures that stand out. If you can just pray this through or, or read it through in your spiritual life, it would be good. You know, Ephesians 3 is a wonderful one there that ends with God can do um, abundantly 
beyond all that we could ask or think according to this uh, power that works within us. And that whole prayer, how God does that by his spirit and Christ dwelling in us, knowing his love and being filled with the fullness of God. All of that is that in that Ephesians 3 prayer, Psalm 23, and just pray through Psalm 23 intelligently and ask the Lord to be your shepherd and to lead you beside still waters and calm, you know, that um, we looked um, a couple years ago, maybe now at the school of prayer where Jesus taught the disciples how to pray. And each, each line of our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Um, let thy kingdom come. That's in me and my family. And I pray through that, every one of my family, that God's kingdom come. That would enrich your prayer life. Well, the Beatitudes were in that same thought. If you take them through as we have been and go through from one through the end, they're a beautiful um, walk in the Christian life. You know, you need to realize that you're powerless. We studied that with Jacob this morning. Oh, Lord, finally, I don't got the power. And I mourn because I'm sinful. And I'm not really meek. I'm stubborn in my heart and stiff-necked. And God needs to make me meek. If I do all that, I'll long for his righteousness. And then I'll be merciful and pure in heart. You know, you can put up all those six. But today, I think, really comes to like a testing point. Today's beatitude is, you know, blessed are the peacemakers. Um, but to be a peacemaker, again, you have to have God's peace, peace with God. And you have to ask that question, do I really have peace with God? I mean, peace that passes understanding, peace that's not disturbed, peace that keeps me going, uh, following him. And we need to do that. You know, next week, there's a fly up here, one fly in the whole church, and he's got me. <laughs> We've got um, peace. This week we're going to study peace. Jesus said, I give you my peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Um, in, in Matthew he said, uh, but he added this. In Matthew he said, think not that I have come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. And Luke, uh, covering the same thing, says I came to bring division. John 16, 33, Jesus said, These things I have spoken unto you that in me, in me you may have your peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good uh, cheer, I have overcome the world. So we look at the peace this week, we'll look at the sword next week. Um, there's really like a, a test here. The test is, do you have peace with God in your heart? Therefore being justified um, with God, we have peace in our heart. And next week is the trial. If we have peace with God, you will have persecution by men. And we'll look at that next week. So peace comes from two words, and I've never had it. <laughs> I think that's the Lord, the, I mean the devil in there, a thorn in the flesh. Okay, peace comes from two Greek words, one, or Greek word. One is erene, which means peace. And it really had to do with just um, absence of war, um, a state of peace or rest. You, you, and fruitfulness would only come as a consequence of peace. So you have peace, and then if there's really no war, then you can have fruitfulness, right? You look at what's going on in Ukraine now, and they do not have fruitfulness. The war is keeping all the crops from going out, being planted. Ships can't go out carrying the grain. There's no fruitfulness because there's no peace. But the fruitfulness is a consequence of having the peace. Well, the Hebrew word goes richer than that. And you know the Hebrew word. If you know two Hebrew words, you can say them with me. Shabbat, shalom, right? There, you just spoke two Hebrew words. Shabbat, of course, means the Sabbath day. It comes from Shabbat, which means rest. So it's the rest that comes related to peace that goes with it. Shalom, shalom, my friend. That's the word in Hebrew for peace. And that had a richer term than just cessation of war. It, it means that at times, but it also had to do with God um, uh, blessing them with eternal life, God working on their heart, God uh, bringing salvation to their life. Ultimately, that is what the peace had to do. And that took on then the meaning in the Greek in the New Testament. Even though the Greek word didn't mean it, in the New Testament now, peace had a richness that, that implied all of that. So peace was not only a sense of rest, um, but it was also a state of being reconciled with God. We're at peace with God. It also is the peace 
as of um, salvation of the whole man. At some point, we will be with God forever. So today, we're going to look at peacemakers, and we're going to look at we become peacemakers through God's work of grace. We become peacemakers through God's work of grace. And we're going to look at that three, um, three divisions today. The gospel of peace, the grace provided, and the genealogy promised. So let's look at the gospel of peace, first of all. The gospel of peace, what's the source of peace? Peace comes from God. To be a peacemaker, we first must have peace, and we get that peace from God. Uh, Romans 10, 15 uses the phrase, um, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel of peace. And it's the gospel of peace we want to talk about today. Um, Job 22, 21 says, Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace with him. Um, Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is what? Stayed upon him. Isaiah 9, 6, to make it more clear, where does our peace come from? For unto you a child shall be born, right? And what will that child's name be? Government will be on his shoulder and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Ephesians 2.14, it says, He himself, speaking of Jesus, He himself is our peace. And Galatians, maybe we'll turn there, Galatians 1, verse 3 and 4. Paul oftentimes either began or closed his letters with grace to you and peace. And um, sometimes he threw love in there, but usually had those two or three in their greetings. And for Paul, it was not just like greetings, like peace to you, you know, like hope all is well. It, it, all that was implied in peace with God was that when he wished him to that. So in Ephesians, Galatians 1, 3, and 4. So talking to the Galatians, he says, verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us out of this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever, amen. So grace and peace comes through Jesus Christ, who can take our hearts and turn them away from evil and ultimately bring us the peace that we need with God. Well, so the source of peace is from God. The substance of peace is peace with God. So with that, we're going to turn to Romans 5, and that's where we get this phrase from, peace with God. Romans 5, 1. And Romans is one of those terms that every time Paul says, therefore, you got to go almost all the way back to the beginning and say, now what's happened? So Paul starts verse chapter 5, verse 1, therefore. So therefore what? He goes all the way back. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. How come? For in the gospel, God has enough power to save everybody who will only trust in him. So Paul's not ashamed of that gospel. In it's God's power is revealed. And he says the righteousness of God is revealed and the wrath of God is revealed all in the gospel. So we need to have this peace, though, with God. So after Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel, he talks about the wickedness of man. Then he talks about the Jews and talks about the wickedness of the Jews. So finally, in, in chapter 3, Paul said, verse 9, uh, there is none righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is not one who seeks after God. All have turned aside. Together we have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. And he goes on with the description there um, that there's no, um, there's no fear of God before their eyes. So there's none. We're all in that state. So with that, then he talks about the glorious um, salvation, how God sent his son. And God sent his son. And through his son now, we can be put right with God, justified with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the word justify, it's as simple as you can get, means literally to put right. Um, if you think of the word doulos, um, the word doulos means servant or slave. And they have a word doulao, which means you make that person a servant or slave. And justifies that same ending that says you're going to make this person righteous. Not just write it in a book, not just declare it. It's putting us right with God. So if we're wrong with God by having sin in our heart, God's work of putting us right with him is to somehow make us right in our attitude and our thought. 
And when that happens, then we will have peace with God. Um, the Today's English version has this verse this way. Now that we have been put right with God through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Isaiah 57, 19, it says, peace, peace, peace to the far and peace to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. The word heal there has to do with literally stitching someone up. Think of someone who's been badly torn or bruised or battered or surgery and everything's wide open. And they have to take that, that thread and sew them together or staples now and, and somehow get them back together, mend them. That's what God's going to do to those who are broken and hurt and bruised and battered and torn by the world. And God can take and heal them. That's all part of God to those who are far off and those who are near. And that's all God's peace that he will give to us, his healing process. So we can have finally peace with him. Whoever consents to renounce sin and open his heart to the love of Christ becomes a partaker of this heavenly peace. Peace with the peace of Christ is harmony with God. See, we're normally at enmity with God. We're sinners at enmity with our master and, and our maker. And only Christ can come and change the heart and give us. That's a whole new covenant. I will make um, a new covenant with them and I'll put in with them a new heart. Right? And he'll write his laws in our heart. That's God's work again of making us so we have peace with him. The peace of heaven brings our heart into harmony with God. So when was the last time you were really fully at peace with God? At peace with God means I'm not going to keep right chomping at the bit. Right? We've studied that. I, um, Psalm 20 or 32 talks about don't be like the horse that has to have a bridle and a bit in it where God has to pull all the time with the reins to get him to turn left or right. He says, I want to just speak to you with understanding. I want you to, to follow my voice. And God wants us just to be peace. And that because we're sinful, we don't have that. God will say, do something. And I'm, I was headed out the door to do something else, right? Oh, God, just let me, you know, I'll repent after I do it. Let me just have fun today. I'm hurting. I need to do this. I need to go into this. And we all have that. We, each of us, the Bible says, have turned to his own way. All of us like sheep. And we need to always finally realize we are sinful. And like Jacob, the one thing that he did finally do was say, God, I messed it all up. And unless you bless me, I'm lost. And we need God's blessing. And God's blessing can give us peace. And when you make that decision, I'm going to be God and all gods, you know, that the only thing lacking will be um, God not sending his spirit, which he's promised to do. But it's not going to be lacking because I'm not going to give him it all. God, take all of my heart, take it, it's your property. And we come through that wrestling and we wrestle in prayer. And Paul said, I had to do that every day. Uh, always caring about my body, the dying of Christ, so that the life of Christ might be manifest in me. So we need to have that work in our heart. And the only one who can put us right with God, Paul spent four chapters here saying it cannot happen by works. Who does God justify? Talked about Abraham in, in Romans 4. God justifies those who try hard, God who justifies those who are almost there, God who justifies those who keep all nine externally, but not in the heart, says God justifies the ungodly. And, and until we realize we're ungodly and say, okay, God, I need you to do the work on my heart. We'll never be with him. But when we finally take that step, there's nothing in me. Good. I need to always come and receive life from him. Then I'm finally at peace with God. Um, I've been put right with God through Christ's work. And that all happens through faith, it says. So I'm put right with God and I can have peace with him through faith in what Jesus has done. And I keep trusting in him. And when I fall, I trust again because he's the one who picked me up. He's the one who can help me walk again. And so that's what the substance of peace here in the Bible is to be really at peace with God. I'm going to be his. I'm going to go where he goes. I'm going to stop when he says stop. I'm going to let him use me in the way he wants to use me and let his spirit empower me so that he can finally do exceeding abundantly beyond all that I even ask or think. And that happens all with God's work. That's the substance of peace is with God. And lastly, under the gospel peace here is the service of peace is about God. When we are serving, when we are being peacemakers, it's about revealing God and his love and his grace to those around us. That's what it means to be a peacemaker. It's just not... Uh, being a, a truce maker about people who are fighting over a property border and let's find a way to, you know, 
settle this. It's ultimately all those disputes which come from the heart of sin still have to do with the solution comes from God and his love. So ultimately, now that doesn't mean we can't be kind to people who are quarreling and disputing and having, we should be peacemaker and have gentle words and kind, uh, soft responses. Remember, a soft answer turns away wrath, right? But a harsh word stirs up anger. So how we speak should be in kindness so we can be a peacemaker with our whole life. The service of peace is about revealing the Father's love. We're not involved in stirring up strife as a church. We're not involved at thinking, oh, do you know what so-and-so is doing? And, and trying to stir the pot and, and cause it to be boiling and unhappy. And Boy, if you see uh, a brother or sister doing something wrong, what's, the, what's Jesus' solution for that? Go to that person personally. And Paul adds in Galatians 6, go with the spirit of meekness. So go with a lot of prayer. You who are spiritual, go to such a one in the spirit of meekness. Look into yourselves lest you too um, fall. So go with a lot of prayer and God and then, and then try to restore that brother or sister. And if not, you bring us another spiritual person. But it's not to go just talking to other people who aren't even involved in it. So, but too often times we can cause division. Satan loves to do that. He's the great divider. God wants us to be peacemakers. He wants a church that does that. So rather than stirring up troubles, we should be letting the grace of God flow through us in kindness, both in word and deed, to the erring and to the hurting who are around us. Christ's mission was to restore the peace that sin has broken. And if we are peacemakers, we will join him in that mission, which is helping restore peace in people's hearts touched by sin. Peacemaker is someone who is surrounded by the sweet savor of Christ. Paul talks about um, how we are a sweet savor representing Christ to the world in 2 Corinthians um, 2 there. The true nature of our religion is not found in our position or our doctrine that we occupy, but it's found in the kindness and peace that we demonstrate in our lives. That's the true position. And, and if Christ has really touched our heart with the first six of these Beatitudes, we will be peacemakers. We'll be peace at, with God and we'll be peacemakers to help other people be at peace with him. What a treasure is a peacemaker in the family. Right? Family that is has in conflict. You know, are you one that stirs up trouble in the family? Or are you there to, to make it an easier, um, happier home? What a treasure it is to be a peacemaker in the family. What a blessing to be a peacemaker in the church. What a joy to be a peacemaker to the distressed. Okay, so that's the, uh, the gospel of peace. We become God's peacemakers through his work of grace. So... His work of grace involves that gospel, bringing us peace with him. Now let's look at the grace provided. How is it that, what has God done to provide us that grace? Human efforts fail to produce true peace because they do not reach the heart. It's the one thing I can't change. You can try to change habits. If you're strong, you might do that, but you can't change your heart. And only God can do that. He said, I will give you a new heart. I can transform your mind. I can bring every thought captive to Christ. I can... Um, um, you'll be not transformed to the renewing, I mean, be not conformed to this world, uh, Romans 12 says. Don't be squeezed into the mold of the world, but let God renew our minds and be transformed. Um, Isaiah 27, 5 says that we should trust in God's strength, and when we take hold of his strength, then we will be at peace with him. It's the only way we can be at peace with him is through his strength. The only power that can bring true peace is the grace of Christ. Peacemakers receive the peace which Christ gives. Um, Colossians 3.15 uses the phrase that says, um, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. You know, Christ had perfect peace in his life. He was tempted in all points as we are. He came and become one like us. And, and yet in everything, he was fully surrendered to his father, fully yielded to his father. And when he was fully yielded to his father, he had a peace that passed all understanding. In the boat, remember, in the storm, when all the disciples were fearful, don't you care, Lord, we're perishing? He had perfect peace with his father. Um, even going to the cross, finally, he was troubled, of course, bearing our sins, but at the very last, his, his last words were, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. 
He had perfect peace with God. And that perfect peace can rule in our hearts, Colossians 3.15. Let the perfect peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The only ground for our peace is receiving the grace of Christ into our heart. It'll subdue our enmity with God. It'll fill our soul with his love. Romans 8, we don't have time to look at all that, but Romans 8 is filled with the work of the Holy Spirit to apply what the work of Christ did. Um, he starts out, the whole chapter 8, Paul starts with no condemnation and he ends 8 with there's no separation. So not only will you never be condemned, those who are therefore, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In the end of the chapter, there's no separation. When did he talks about the work of the Spirit? He talks about what the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So that's where we have real peace with God. It's the Spirit bringing me life. What the law could not do, weak as it was, God did through His Son, sending Him in the likeness of sinful flesh and offering for sin He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the re requirement or righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh. That's my own effort my own ways, setting my heart on what I want. We don't walk that way, but we walk according to the Spirit. And then he did contrast those who have their minds set on the, uh, those who are in the flesh have their minds set on the flesh. If you're living in the world, you're going to have your mind set on those things. Those who are in the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. The mind set on the flesh is death, he says. The mind set on the Spirit is what? Life and peace. That's how we get peace, is through the Holy Spirit, um, Walking with the Spirit, Galatians 5 talks about walking in the Spirit. You won't carry out the desires of the flesh. It's having that peace with God. Yes, Lord, I'm going to follow you. Yes, I'm going to be with you. Yes, I'm going to let you lead with your Spirit. And I hope you give me grace and strength to follow. That's where we get the grace that we need. Um, lastly, the genealogy promised. So the grace provided, there's no limit to the grace. In fact, we didn't look at Ephesians uh, four talks about you can have grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Each one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. That means there's no limit to the grace God can give to help you. Change your heart, fill your heart with kindness and love to be a peacemaker among the people around you. What's the genealogy promise? Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be, they shall be called what? Children of God. That's our genealogy. We become children of God. If you're a child of God, you will have peace with God and you will be a peacemaker. They go back and forth there. Romans 8 again, uh, verse 14, Paul's talking about, for all who are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. How do you become a child of God? You let God's Spirit lead you. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption of sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. I remember, and I've, I, excuse me for James, but I'm going to share a story on James. And we're so glad you're here. But I remember he was a little kid. You know, I don't know, baby Jack's age. He was five, six years old. Little kid. We're in a store at the, when we used to go to the mall. Um, and he's, he lost vision of us. He just went to the next aisle or we went to the next aisle. And he looked up and realized he couldn't see mom or dad. And in that moment, he was alone in this whole store and there just a panic set in. And, and he, he's cried out, mom. And I, I had a pitiful little cry, mom. And right away, you know, we heard that and we came there. But that's what God wants us to cry out to him. He wants us to cry out that way. Abba, father, that Abba word is daddy. It's a very tender, it's what the little child would call him, mom and dad. Um, it's daddy, or I get called papa by my grandkids. You know, it's that endeared term, and it says, God, I'm in trouble, I need you. And God always wants us to cry out like with that. His spirit causes us to cry out like that. He will tell us our heart's not right, what should we do? Struggle against it, promise God I'll do better next time. We should cry out to God, I need cleansing right now, Lord. I need you to help me let this go. I need you to help me to have a new mind in Christ. I need you to help me to bring every thought, including this one, Lord. Uh, subject to captivity, to the obedience of Christ. And he can do that. That's what it means to be children of God. He goes on the next verse there, um, verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's the genealogy um, that we have with God. The genealogy promised is that we can be true children of God uh, with his spirit. Right now, that can happen. 
and that we can listen to his voice and go on from there. I'm going to close with um, a prayer written by um, St. Francis of Assisi, and, uh, which wasn't his real name, but he was from Assisi. And this was written somewhere around the year 1200 A.D., and I don't know a whole lot about him, but he was a man who tried a friar um, in the Catholic Church, but he did his best to try to live a life that Christ would live to people. And here was his prayer. You'll, you'll, you'll recognize it. Um, he said, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, not to be understood as to be understand, uh, to understand, not to be loved, but to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Do you have peace with God? I mean, really, only you know, you and God, God can help you know you don't have it. Do you have peace that says, boy, I'm, I'm with him. We're like one. We're one team. You know, like it's a team. We saw that being yoked with Christ. Um, um, all you are weary and heavy laden. Come unto me and you, I will give you rest. Take my what? Yoke upon you. We looked at that a couple weeks ago. Who's got the other half of that yoke on his neck? Christ, right? And so we're yoked with him. And if we learn to be at peace with him, when he leads, we'll follow and we'll be like a team. And do you have that kind of peace in your life? If you do, you will be a peacemaker. And then if you do, then I encourage you to pray this week. Go through our mission statement again. How can I make God's love known to those around me? Who is not at peace in my life? Who am I not in peace with, maybe? And what can I do with the power of prayer to have God's spirit? We're working with God's spirit. We're his children now. What can I do to have God's spirit work ahead of time before I get to someone to prepare their heart so I can be a peacemaker there? And if you don't have real peace with God, there's no better time than right now to invite him in. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you. We bow before you as our father that we can cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, that you send your spirit, Lord, to make us your children. Oh, we pray that you might forever guide us, Lord. Open our eyes to the things that we're so stubborn against seeing, Lord. Help us to see the sin in our life and turn from them. Help us to see, Lord, and understand the many places we don't have peace in our life. And help us just to be willing to accept peace with you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the work of our Savior, Lord, we pray that you might make us right with you. And if someone hasn't done that in their life, Lord, we pray right now there in their heart, they'll say, Lord, I, I need that. I need your peace in my life right now, and please come in. And we know, Lord, the moment we ask, you come. We just pray that you might make us peacemakers, Lord, that we might take those who aren't at peace with you and bring to them the wonderful love of God and help them to be at peace with you, Lord. And we pray all these things, Lord, in the name of him who is our peace. Amen. Our closing song is going to be number 518, Standing on the Promises. Everything God asks us to do is really a promise because he will work in us. He's promised that he will work all these things in us and through us. So as you think about being a peacemaker this week, just remember that's a promise that God will do that through you and in you.
Father, we do stand upon your promises, Lord. And we remember the promise that says you can take our sins and remove them as far as the east is from the west. You can take our stains, Lord, and make them as white as snow. You can put us right with you through your son, and you can give us peace with you. Oh, Lord, we just pray that you might fulfill those promises today to us. Take our hearts, we pray, and lead us this week. We pray in your wonderful name. Amen.